Lord God, giver of life and giver of all good gifts, we pray that you open our inner eyes and ears of faith to hear your voice this morning, to see what you are doing in our midst. In these times of scarcity and loss, we pray that the church may rise up, raise up and take its position, rise up and take its place amidst this crisis, that men and women everywhere may see and experience your love and generosity, that people may know your presence in times of their trouble, and that your name may be glorified. Through Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God. It's a wonderful opportunity to be here. It's a bit nostalgic for me. Um, when I heard uh, Reverend Waswa talking about me, sometimes I don't remember the things I've done. But uh, this is my university. <laughs> I finished in 1989. Were you born? Um, <laughs> You weren't born. My son came through here. There's lots of memories. Uh, the professors, we were with them in class. Some of them, some of you are much, much younger. And uh, Bishop, I really praise the Lord for this wonderful, wonderful opportunity. We will turn to the scripture that was given to us today. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and um, although the portion that was read started from verse 6, we will look at sacrificial. The topic I was given this morning was sacrificial giving, uh, sharing sacrificially with members of the body of Christ. So this is a particular type of sharing. It is uh, it's a t particular type of giving. It is sharing with the body of Christ. It was in the year 1996. Uh, this was the third year of our missionary work in South Africa. We had recently moved from uh, what was then called Transkai, and we moved to Port Elizabeth. And we moved into Warmer Township, which was a township that was designated particularly for the black poor. It was in the middle of Port Elizabeth in South Africa. It was a community that was racially and economically divided. There was a railway that divided the two groups, the white population across the railway, many of them living in lavish homes, many of them millionaires, and then the poor black community in a shanty, tin, shacked. You know, our, at least for ours, ours are mud. But have you seen tin houses or iron sheet houses, paper, sometimes, you know, cardboard. And that was the place we were called to, um, to minister at the time. And so on our side of the railway, the black side, uh, we, the vicarage in which we lived, which was one of the few permanent houses there, which we had recently built, we actually built it before we went to minister, uh, was surrounded by makeshift uh, paper shacks. And actually the church which we were asked to minister in, uh, the church building was also a makeshift uh, building. These people are amazing. 
if the, 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 the church falls down today, whoo, you're worried, you're making plans, and you come back and they've already put it up. And so um, let me tell you the few permanent houses that were near us. There was the police station. Always there was only one exit and there was the police station. Next to the police station was the liquor store. So you drink and you get caught by the police, right? Then also a, uh, some generous giver gave, put up a community center. And there was a brand new, the time we moved in, in 95, they had just put up a brand new high school. It was just post, you know, we had just voted for the first time. And um, so here we were at St. Augustine's Church, a makeshift iron sheet building. But we coming from East Africa, from Uganda, with hearts of revival, we came with a purpose. We came with a message of love. We came with a message of reconciliation. So one of the things that we did, we were trying to bring reconciliation between the black poor community and the white and uh, the Anglican community. And so just like uh, Reverend Paul said, this week we have a love week, a mission week. We had one of those missions, and we seem to be the only people of color at that mission. And we went to join them at, for an overnight, the first overnight I had on that side. And to be kind to us so that the black population could come across, they the nearest church across the railway was where we had, because how could we worship in a, a tin shack? So here we were, we had this overnight. And of course, time came, um, and it was time to pray. And um, suddenly I heard this voice saying, I heard, break the curse of poverty, Lord. We pray that every square inch of Walmart Township will become, each place will have a millionaire. Huh. I opened my eyes and I was thinking, okay, really, Lord? Is this how we deal with what has happened for decades? for decades, for centuries in South Africa. My, my mind went haywire. I, I had a sort of mental disconnect, an emotional disconnect. And I was saying, Lord, poverty, a curse? A curse from who? And these people really saying, Relieve us of the guilt, Lord. You know, do something miraculous. Relieve us of the guilt of their poverty and the shame of looking across from our homes and seeing this shanty town, this scrawny shanty town. And so I was saying, Lord, am I hearing right? Is this in the right place? And before I knew it, those of you who know Rev D, those of you who know Diana, I blurted out a prayer. I've never blurted a counter prayer to someone. And I said, Lord, I pray that our brothers and sisters on this side of the divide will share with the poorer brothers and sisters on the other side of the divide that, Lord, they will learn to love us, to share their skills with us, open up opportunities and access for us, and share knowledge that they may grow, develop with dignity and strength to provide for themselves. And I couldn't hear the Pentecostal amen come back to me. And so 
here we were, and, and, and I thought, okay, I'm a guest here. I don't know how people, there was silence, and then people just continued with their prayer. Um, giving is one of the characteristics of God. It's actually the very nature of God. God is a benevolent God. God is a generous God. God gives his all. It's demonstrated in his son. God wants so much for us. His very nature is generous. And uh, giving was characteristic of the Old Testament, the New Testament church. Um, we all know in uh, Acts chapter 6 and verse 14, when they began to preach the gospel, they realized there was a problem. They were widows, they were orphans. And um, they wanted to make sure they took care of everybody. And so what they did was they appointed deacons, deacons to take care of widows and orphans and of the ministry of compassion. I don't know why today we don't have perpetual deacons. In some countries we do. But in Uganda we think it's too low for us. But they were deacons particularly set aside to do that ministry of compassion. I think I should have remained there because people keep saying, what are you? Because uh, I seem to um, have the anointing of compassion. And then also the church, we know they regularly broke bread together, they shared meals, and they shared their belongings so that there was no one in need. But as in every church community, there always arises a problem. Hey, there was an Ananias and Sapphira problem. They wanted to blend in. They also wanted to be applauded for being generous and being part of the Christian community that gives sacrificially. So they sell their land, money which belonged to them. And they could have chosen in their hearts to say, let's give half. But they wanted to bluff the apostles and make them think they've given the full amount. And we know what happened to them. Um, I don't know whether they had heart attacks or whatever, but conniving against the Lord is not something you want to take on. And so we had that sort of self-seeking appearing like generosity, a self a generosity that was wanting. And so the, the church grew in leaps and bounds uh, through the missionary work of Peter, of Paul, and his colleagues, and there were obvious, still, economic disparities. Um, amongst the congregations they established, for example, the congregations of Thessalonica, Beria, they were known to be poorer than um, those area of Macedonia than those who came from Corinth. And so there were those disparities. And in this text, Paul is making a, an appeal amongst the Gentile Christians to fundraise, to support the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. That's the background to that passage. And so it would be very similar to the story I've shared where it would be um, the, uh, the Corinthians would be the white side of the railway uh, fundraising, um, but it would, be like, it would be like the Gentiles, the Gentiles would be like the black side of the railway uh, fundraising for the white side of the railway because the Jews were known to be God's own people, the promised ones. The Gentiles had not yet been accepted. And so their giving as Gentile Christians to the Jewish Christians would have been a, not only a great opportunity, but a 
powerful witness to the Christian Jews. It would have been a wonderful testimony. And Paul is now beginning to do uh, probably what the Archbishop has been doing for the church house. He is encouraging the Corinthians, who he's known previously have been very generous, to, um, to give. He's reminding them of their promise to give. And so he testifies about the Macedonians, the poorer Christian community, and their effort, and how they surpassed even their own expectations in giving. Philippi, Thessalonica, and Beria had given despite their own economic status and their own hardships at the time, the hardships they were going through. And so here we have Paul appealing to the Corinthians, calling them brothers. Remember, you're part of the family of Christ. You're part of the Christian family. I'm calling you because as Christians, we have an obligation to make sure everyone has enough. And um, for the Christians, it was a characteristic sharing and caring were hallmarks of those who belonged to the Christian faith. And so here they are, he says, look, the Macedonians have given way beyond their ability. And you know, they didn't give it grudgingly. They didn't give it, you know, because they were coerced. They were not manipulated in any way, bring everything here to the front. Actually, the Macedonians said they saw it as a privilege. If you read uh, chapter 8, they said it is a privilege and not a burden to bless the saints. I wish we could come to that one day, that it would be a privilege, not a burden to bless the saints. In the 80s, I remember... Bishop Kauma, because I was ordained in the Namirembe Diocese. He had this project, which I thought at the time as a young Christian was ridiculous. There had been some natural disaster in the States. I forget which state it was. It must have been one of those hurricanes or one of those fires that have gone on and on. And we had just come out of, we hadn't even come out of an economic war in the 80s. Because after 79, we went on to, probably it was that he made that appeal around about 86, 87. And we were, we were struggling as a nation, yet alone as a church. We were struggling. And Bishop Kauma boldly comes and makes an appeal amongst the churches that have lost so much to the war. And he says, bring a contribution to our brothers and sisters in the States. And I was like, does this man know what he's talking about? The dollar to the Uganda shilling? Well, I mean, we'll be ashamed. We, what, what, what can we contribute? But he boldly went around and I don't know how much he collected, but what little he collected, he changed into dollars and he gave. And it's now I know what a powerful ministry that must have been, even if it was a drop in the ocean. As ridiculous as it may have sounded, this was Uganda's love to the Christians on the other side who have also lost everything even though their government could help them recover. And it was received as a tremendous witness from Uganda. You know, it's very, very powerful not to be a receiver. <laughs> Just the one who's on the receiving end. Uh, you know, all the time, yeah, the, the receive, but that you could be generous could give a generous and bountiful gift to people who 
we may assume are okay. It is a gift of love. I want to say that the greatest gift I have ever received was when my husband was sick with cancer and the gate man at All Saints Cathedral came with his 2,000 and he said, I don't know what you're going to do with this, but I feel moved to give. Well, he caused me to shed tears because I, I, I received a lot of healing love through that gift. He went on to call his son who was born after my husband's death, Solomon. And so you could see the great love that was in. And so he, here he is. He says, you Corinthians, you excel in faith, you excel in speech, you, have, you excel in knowledge, and um, you excel in your earnestness and love for us as Paul. So now you must excel in the grace of giving, 2 Corinthians 8, 7 and 8. I'm not commanding you. I'm just reminding you <laughs> of your giving, that your giving will be a demonstration of your love for Christ who gave up everything, who gave up everything so that you might become rich. You know, we only have one type of wealth that we think of. We think of it in terms of cash. But there's so much wealth. There's so much wealth in being loved and loving others. There's so much wealth. Um, many people tell me, Reverend Diana, you're rich. And I'm, I, I sort of, mm -hmm. And they say, yes, the social capital you have. The connections, the love you have shown to people has come back to you as a great wealth. And so he says, you've done it before. You did it last year, you can do it again. But he's telling them that you must have Christ-like giving. Desire to give to the best of your ability. Do you know how ridiculous it is in this day and age where people are forced to give up what they don't have? This whole sowing a seed concept. I know, I know a student right here from UCU whose parents probably gathered fees from uncles and aunts and as they were coming to university, they stopped by a church and they said, you know, sow a seed and you will get a hundredfold. So the young man sold his fees to get no fold <laughs> and no education. No, 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 no. This sow a seed, not beyond your ability. He says, we don't want to you to give so that it is reversed, that you can no longer, that you also, we need to come to your rescue. And so he talks, I never knew that Paul actually talked about equality, but in the scriptures he said, so there will be equality, a fair distribution of resources. For me, it's equal access and equal possibilities. And remember, for those who have been blessed with much, to whom much is given, much will be required. You'll be required to give good stewardship. You'll be required to be transparent and accountable. And what you have been given is to bless others, not just to bless yourself. And so he sends an advanced team so that when he comes, they don't fumble and feel embarrassed that they had not kept their own obligation. He, 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 he sent an advanced team to help them make sure they are ready when he comes with the Macedonians to receive their gift. He says there should be no coercion. Everyone should give what they have prepared to give in their heart. 
I want to ask the Christians out there, how many of us, even as we come to church, know what we want to give? Have we prepared to give? Sometimes we are embarrassed to even give what we can't afford to give because you didn't even think about giving to the Lord. You're like, oh, but I offer tree. Then, you know, the 1,000 is there and the 20,000 and your neighbor has seen the 20,000. So, so you put the 20,000 there and you're like, wow, how do I get home now? We don't even prepare or we just give the change from the yesterday's groceries. We don't pray and say, this is the work of the kingdom of God. This week, I want to be paying, or every week I want to be at least giving so much to the church. No, we tend to either give change or give out of embarrassment or feel a bit apologetic when there's a sudden fundraiser because things have fallen short. And so here we have, um, they, they say, don't give, give as you have prepared in your heart to give. And give cheerfully, not grudgingly. I remember <laughs> my husband went to look for some long lost relatives and they lost their way and they arrived in the evening and they had never seen him in a collar. He was newly ordained. And as he arrived, people in that compound took off and hid in the banana plantation. So as he stood in the courtyard, he was wondering what happened. And then they came out one by one. They said, hey, Jeddah, we thought the priest had come again. <laughs> to fundraise for the church building. And so, you know, these were people who are used, when they see the priest, they know they are forced to give away their goats or whatever, either bishop is visiting or the church building. They were giving under coercion. And so the church needs to rethink. People need to give out of love, not out of coercion. There are types of givers amongst us, and um, we need to give for the right reason, the right motive. They are what they call the auto-givers. Those who give spontaneously, they have it. Um, but also, those people, because it benefits them. Hey, Reverend Diana will bring you to the front seat. You're a, a giver. You, 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 there's a way that you get recognition somewhere where it benefits you. They're the occasional givers. Uh, those ones give without any real motive. They give because they have. Now there's this one, the penitential givers. They are, they, they, they are trying to repent. They cannot repent. We wives know about penitential givers. We get a lot of nice things when husbands can't say sorry. Hey, that's where you get your new shoes, your nice dress, and sometimes even like a small car, you know? <laughs> They're the penitential givers. And so someone walks into church, they know their life has been messed up, and um, they don't want... To, to come before the generous mercy of the Lord to ask for his forgiveness. To, so they give. And they think, that's covered it. Haven't I bought that church tablecloth? Haven't I bought that church window? Now who will say that I'm a sinner, right? There's the theatrical giver. Yes, I went to a church, people. I was hiding in the back because I was an Anglican priest and some family members had asked me to come to give thanks. I, I had just come back to Kampala and I didn't know there were all these churches. So I sat at the back and I'm thinking, aha, what type of church is this? What do they teach? But you know, I was in my collar. 
they were excited. They sang and praised the Lord, and the pastor eyed me. And they said, you know, there's this priest who has come all the way from South Africa. Uh, if you come from America, it's even worse. And those days we used to have, we were used to the usual giving bags. They had a huge basket. They had a huge basket. And I, and, and I was thinking, Kakati River and Yogira Yakagamo. But really, they wanted me to give thanks in that basket. But I wasn't sure that I wanted to perpetuate the ministry that I was seeing there because I saw a lot of manipulation, people who went forward with their car keys and were left to walk home, that sort of. So there's those theatrical givers. They get the applause in return for status, for visibility, again, for front row seats. They're the conventional givers. They, because, they give because they're expected to give. When you go to church, you're expected to give. So you come to the basket. Everybody's going to the basket. How can they see you sit behind and not give? But then there is what they call the Christ-like giver, motivated by love, sacrificial love. And that sort of giving bears fruit. It's fruitful giving. It bears fruit. It's a response of worship. Giving becomes a response to God's love. It's an act of worship. You prepare, you make a decision, you desire to honor God, and you bring it forth in confidence of his love, in obedience to what he asks us to do, to bring it cheerfully, to it's liberating giving. It's liberating giving. It's a giving that blesses. And you know what? God will take care of you. God will take care of you. We don't want to guilt trip people into giving. That I feel so guilty that I write a check. <laughs> That's why you get those checks that bounce. The guilt trip. Hey, kakati wano, tulina wo kanoni. You know, they even put your status higher. <laughs> and they begin naming all the things you own or they think you own. And so you can't tell them I'm going to give 10,000. <laughs> There's another thing that I discovered in... Uh, South Africa. Also the other way of giving that causes people to be enslaved. Do you know that you can enslave poor people by giving them everything? Even our children, we give them everything and they lack nothing and they won't change. We had a family that was born in the bush and remained in the bush. They didn't desire to go anywhere. Because there was a white family that used to give them breakfast, lunch, supper. And you're like, eh, don't these people desire to be anything? There was no motivation. When it came to breakfast, they were given served beautifully. Lunch, supper. And we told those people, stop giving. Ask them to sweep the compound or wash a car. Well, the guy who tried washing my car messed it up. And you could see that they had been enslaved. They had be had this dependency syndrome. The one we have in Uganda. Government. There is that sowing a seed because you want to receive. That's the wrong motive. God blesses you anyway. But people now like, let me sow this much so I can reap this much. It's become a business thing. That is not God honoring. It is being abused. People take loans to sow a seed, hoping it will multiply and find themselves in terrible debt. Do you know what the scripture says? He will enlarge your harvest 
in righteousness. He didn't say he'll give you for every dollar ten dollars. He will enlarge your harvest in what? In righteousness. You'll be made rich in every way so that you can be generous. Riches are when money doesn't control you anymore. Money is an, something that you use. It doesn't use you. You can then be generous over and over again. It's not to enrich you when the Lord blesses you. It is to help you bless others. And I want to end with this. A conversation between an angel and a young man. And so the angel says to the young man, go break to the need, sweet charity's bread. Forgiving, I want to say forgiving, is living, said the angel. And so the young man said, must I give again and again? Oh no, said the angel. Just give till the master stops giving to you. May the Lord bless us as we reflect on his call for us to give. To give sacrificially to the body of Christ. We know in these hard times we've been called to give again and again. There's been loss People are hungry. Don't tire of giving. If you have something, give. The Lord will richly bless you. And I don't know, he's going to surprise you in the way he's going to bless you. And that is what I call self-donation. Stuff is stuff. But when you love someone, it is called self-donation. And that's the sort of sacrificial giving that the Lord wants from us. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Father, you know that in this nation that there are many people in dire need. Those who don't have anything to put on the table. Those whose businesses have been completely torn down during this time of pandemic. Those who have been discouraged and are afraid that perhaps they might not even go back to school because of the financial losses the families have made. But we thank you that you are a generous God and that Lord in you who is the giver of life and all good gifts, we can put our trust. We pray even if we have the smallest of gifts. Teach us to share with love. And we trust, Lord, that you take care of each person. We pray that each one will grow in a new and more prosperous way, even after this time of hardship. Lord, teach us anew how to give, how to serve, and how to witness for you. For I pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us give God a mighty hand clap.